Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our opening webinar for our Imaging Science program. Um, this program is a celebration of science photography and making observations of the world around us um, through photography. So through this webinar, um, photography tutorials, we're going to be and other social media posts, we're going to be giving you the tools that you need to take some really interesting observations of the world around you and share them with us. And with that, I'm going to head uh, I'm going to hand this off to Erica Reinfeld, who is the um, the uh, outreach coordinator at the Koch Institute. Um, so take it away, Erica. Thank you so much, Brian. All right, let me pull my screen up here. Um, and thank you to everyone who's filled out the poll. Uh, we'll be looking at the results of that in just a little bit. Uh, but let me, I'm going to start things off with an intro and then we'll jump into the, our conversation with our expert photographers. All right, so hopefully everyone can see this now. And before I move into uh, introducing our speakers, I just want to tell you a little bit about who I am and why I'm here. Uh, and I'm going to go, I'm going to move the poll off the screen and let you end that, Brian, if you are um, in control of that. All right, so. I am a scientist by training, I'm an educator in practice, and as you can see, most of my career has been spent looking at uh, interdisciplinary work. So, hi, this is me. This is me in our uh, public galleries uh, here at the Koch Institute at MIT. And um, that's actually what I want to talk uh, to you about first. Uh, this is the, uh, this is, I think, the main reason Brian asked me to be a part of this webinar. Um, and so as part of my role, uh, I manage the public galleries at the Koch Institute, which is MIT's Cancer Research Center. It's a convergence of biology and engineering. And one of the central exhibits in our public galleries uh, is the Image Awards exhibition. Um, so that's every year, scientists and researchers from MIT's uh, biomedical engineering, life sciences, uh, submit images and a panel of judges who are made up of scientists and artists and others uh, choose 10 images from we get about 150 every year uh, and they select 10 of those images to be put on display uh, in these eight foot tall light boxes on Main Street in Cambridge. Um, so what you see here is a, a snapshot from our 2016 exhibition. There's a cryogenically frozen stem cell on the left and then uh, where Asha's standing. Uh, she's this is a mosaic of synthetic polymers that are interacting with various cell types um, taken with fluorescence microscopy. Um, so any image in the display has to meet two key criteria. It has to be visually engaging and it has to be scientifically compelling. It can't just be a pretty picture. It has to tell a good story about real research. So in Asha's case, um, she was examining these interactions between synthetic materials and cells to identify promising candidates for new materials to be used in biomedical research uh, and clinical applications. So it's a screening experiment, which serves as a bridge between discovery and innovation, ideas and actions. And that's one of the themes I think we want to talk about uh, in our exploration of science photography, that connection um, between ideas and action. Uh, but before we do that, I want to show you another view of this image, which is juxtaposed with images of exploding stars taken by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Uh, this was put together by a former colleague of mine, Kim Arcand. And I think it's just a really beautiful illustration of how scientific imagery can be used to make connections between different disciplines. Uh, so on that note, if you, if you were reading my earlier slide, um, you'll see that I spent a fair bit of time in the museum world looking at how people make sense of scientific images. Do they see them as information or do they see them as art? And well worth a graduate degree, the answer of course is yes, uh, they do. Uh, and so to illustrate that, I have one more comparison that I wanna show you. Uh, so this is the image on the left was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope to commemorate the 15th anniversary of the satellite's launch. Uh, it shows a star forming nebula in the constellation Serpens. And then on the right is a painting, I admit it, it's not a photograph, um, by Thomas Moran. Elizabeth Kessler from uh, Stanford has pointed out how the decisions that the scientists made in the colors and the framing of images taken with cameras on the Hubble Space Telescope really um, invoke these 19th century paintings and photographs as well in both their composition and theme. 
So this kind of blue sky background and the towering pillars and the light reflecting around them, it represents scientific knowledge about the nebula where these stars are being born. But they also call to mind this exploration of new frontiers. So um, with that connection, between art and science in mind. I'm going to set aside the fancy telescopes and microscopes and uh, leave you with some more down to earth pictures. As I introduce our first speaker, I'll introduce uh, Felice Frankel, who is a research scientist in the departments of chemical engineering and mechanical engineering here or there at MIT. Uh, she's an award winning science photographer and her most recent book is picturing science and engineering and it's published by MIT Press. Uh, she teaches an online edX course, Making Science and Engineering Pictures, a Practical Guide to Presenting Your Work. I've known Felice for a number of years now. We've worked on both education workshops um, and, on image and on this Image Awards project. And so I am delighted that she's going to be our first speaker and share her experience as a science photographer. Wonderful. Can, can, can you hear me? <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I want to thank Erica and, and Brian for inviting me. I'm really delighted to do this on a beautiful day like today and wrap our head around something that is beautiful and something that is somewhat of a distraction, if, if I could call it that. But it's a, it's a real joy to be with all of you. And thank you for coming. Um, I am now, I, I'm going to share, uh, I hope, play my screen. Um, Thank you, Erica and Brian, for inviting me. I, I'm so delighted, and I can't wait to talk to Keith and look at his amazing pictures, which we're all going to be astounded by. Um, but my whole thing is going to try to explain to you why I do what I'm doing. Goethe wrote, that which we know, we have first seen. Well, let me tell you, when I make photographs, I see things that I've never seen before, obviously, but I also see that it is a means of discovery. I'm constantly asking questions whenever I take a picture of some sort of scientific phenomena. This is a, an old picture that I did not take from many years ago. This kind of started me in my whole new world, taken out of, uh, from a lab that George Whitesides ran uh, at Harvard. It's uh, a little complicated, but I'll quickly tell you that it is water that is spreading out on a surface and stopping at what we're calling hydrophobic lines. That's what started me on my whole new journey because that's a picture that they made and I said to them, we could do better and we did. This is the same phenomena where the hydrophobic lines are preventing the water from blending together. That is in fact what the science is about. This was my job to help them communicate the science better. This is Alice Nasto's image of, of material that she made that she's studying in mechanical engineering. It's a fine image. This is the image that I made of the identical material. I hope you see the difference. If you don't see the difference, I'm in real trouble. But basically what I'm trying to do is engage you to look more clearly at the, at the research. Here's an image that I got off of, of the uh, online, and it's a picture of something called ferrofluid. This is the picture that I made many years ago of ferrofluid that I guess people still enjoy looking at. Ferrofluid is uh, oil suspension of small iron particles, and when you put magnets next to it, it, it responds to the magnetic field. I made this for a book that George Whitesides and I did called On the Surface of Things. It, for me, most of this is about getting you to see and to first look, to engage you, and to get you to understand that making beautiful images and honest images, which I could get to at the end, is a means of engagement, which I think is critical at this point of our lives. We've got to engage people into our, what is going on in the research labs. And that's why I wrote the book, Picturing Science and Engineering. It's for researchers, but there's a lot of photography, basic photography in it. And I'm, I'm, I'm unabashedly introducing you to the book. I hope you could take a look at it. You can use a flatbed scanner 
it's quite extraordinary what you could do with a flatbed scanner if you, if you, if you set the DPI correctly. We, I talk about using backgrounds that uh, kind of inform what it is that we're looking at. I show a lot of microscopic images and, and how uh, using certain techniques in microscopy could advance the way it, it looks and also, frankly, getting you to look. That's what I'm trying to do. And the other part in the book is all about the fact that science, in fact, is everywhere. And I suggest that when you make pictures of everything around you, it's a means of getting you to ask questions. What it is? It, what is it that exactly I'm seeing? Uh, if we had if we had more interactivity, I would ask you what it is that you think you're looking at, and what you are looking at is the glass cover of a, of a sautéing pan, and I am sautéing uh, different peppers. The thing about this example is that I made it with my phone. And years ago, I used to tell the scientists, "You really can't take great pictures with your phone." Well, I've changed my mind. I, it, it's quite remarkable. Even walking down Com Ave, I remember distinctly seeing these trees. For whatever reason, they were wrapped around with cellophane, and I was looking at these assemblies of drops around the crease. There is a scientific reason for the reason why that they are lining up. Everywhere is science, and why not start making pictures of it? Uh, this is just more fun. I, I, I got this device where I put my phone on the microscope. It was a, it was, it was a device that e easily puts it, uh, allows you to see it. And these are just coffee bubbles that are kind of doing their thing. Uh, I'm also very involved with finding the metaphor. Sometimes you actually cannot always take images of what the science is. So st trying to find some sort of photographic metaphor. In this situation, I'm tr we're trying to describe what binary means. This is the, the way computers talk to each other. This is the inside of a, a music box, and it, the, the notes go on, off, on, off, and that is a suggestion of a metaphor. Here's where I, I am, in fact, putting a lot of pieces together of photographs to make an image that actually doesn't exist. The image exists, but the thing that you're seeing doesn't really exist. Hopefully, it's telling you a story of something called remote epitaxy, which is too complicated to go into. But these are all pieces of pictures that I put together. But in the end, I always discuss with the researchers to maintain the scientific integrity in your images. And that is a long conversation that perhaps we'll have at some point. For example, when I made this picture of a yeast colony out of Jerry Fink's lab, what I decided to do was to delete the Petri dish because I was blown away at what was going on in this yeast, yeast colony. The detail was astounding. And I wanted you to only pay attention to that. So I deleted the Petri dish. The question is, was I permitted to do so? And that is, again, a long conversation that perhaps we might have someday. I say yes, because the data was not manipulated. This is the data not the Petri dish. So there we go. There's a little hint of what I do. And it's a real joy to be with you guys. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Felice. All right. So what we want to do now is turn things over to Keith, and he'll give you a little taste of what he does. Uh, I think those of you out there will notice that we've, we've chosen these two folks for a very particular reason. They complement each other beautifully. So we're going to hear from Keith momentarily, uh, and then we'll then we'll have a little discussion. We'll get the two of them actually talking to each other uh, about these science photos. And we'll start to take some questions from your audience, from you in the audience, again, using the Q&A feature. So let me introduce Keith. Uh, Keith is a celebrated underwater photographer working at the intersection of art, science, and technology to showcase the visual complexity of underwater environments from coral reefs to uh, coastal rivers to the wide open sea. He is an assistant professor of photography at SUNY, the Fashion Institute of Technology, and a visiting artist at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Sea Grant, uh, and the recipient of the Ernest F. 
Hollings Ocean Awareness Award. Um, I met Keith um, probably a f almost a year ago um, because one of his uh, planktonic images is currently on display in the Koch Institute Public Galleries. Uh, so he has this beautiful image of dinoflagellates and I got to talk to him about the story behind it. But he takes a lot of wonderful pictures and I'm gonna let him tell you what he does. Oh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Can you guys all see me and see my screen? Um, looks yes? good to me. Okay, great. Yep, looks good. So thank you, Erica and Brian. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I have to say, it's just so inspiring to follow Felice, her stunning images and the photographic process. So it's a real honor to be here. So thank you. Um, I thought I would talk today about what it's like working with conservation-based organizations and being fortunate to travel around the world to use the art of photography and ocean photography in particular to inspire awareness in conservation. This picture here is an aerial photo of a tropical coral reef from about a thousand feet within the remote Fijian islands of Tortoya. The photograph was captured on board a small helicopter with the doors removed. Sitting outside the helicopter, I was harnessed and tethered in with the wind blowing and you could uh, communicating with the pilot via headsets to get the right pitch, angle, and uh, image here. For the next few minutes, I'd like to take you on a journey beneath the waves. Underwater photography is a challenge. We're limited by air, light, time, depth, animal behavior, just to name a few of the constraints. I like this image of me diving because it's, uh, it captures the strobes illuminating the reef. At depth, the wavelength of red is absorbed and the ocean appears a blue gray. But with the addition of light, I'm able to reveal vibrant colors. In the Galapagos Islands, I was on an assignment focusing on biodiversity and sharks. As we began to swim back to the boat, I observed a large aggregation of sea stars along the vast open sandy bottom. The Galapagos is known for its biodiverse marine ecosystems. It's full of mystery and intrigue. But the colors of these sea stars are natural, but they're revealed by the light of the strobe. Wildlife photography is about hours, days, weeks, maybe even years of patience, followed by an instant of action. And this photograph of a juvenile frigate bird diving to catch a fish is an example of that. It was a behavior I observed and spent two days waiting in shallow water with the lens pre-focused, the strobes above and below the water. The frigate birds never land in the water. These birds are unbelievable. They accelerate downward, focusing on the fish. When they get near the surface, they virtually stall they place their head in the water, they switch between surface vision, underwater vision, without blinking, catch the fish, and then fly away, all in an instant. I stopped the lens, snapped the picture, looked it back, and with a little bit of luck, I managed to get just this photo here. There are also unexpected moments. Within the tentacles of a jellyfish is a school of juvenile trevally that seek shelter. If you look closely, you can see that I cap I, uh, you can see them right in the tentacles. To capture this image, I inverted myself underwater, giving the fish's perspective of what life must look like through the waves into the clouds and the sky. Oftentimes I collaborate with scientists and I often experiment with other ways to visualize marine environment. This photo of one of my colleagues using a fluorescent strobes to survey the coral reefs. The psychedelic colors emitted by fluorescence light showcase another way of looking at art in nature. While at the same point, the colors may lead to a deeper understanding about the health of our corals. Sometimes I'm on assignments in Indonesia or other places around the world, diving with scientists, setting out to find and discover new possible species of coral. This is one that's being described as a flower-like pattern that is unlike any other known species. People often ask, what is it like to travel with you on assignment? And actually the most stressful part of my job is so nervously checking all the luggage and bringing all the equipment everywhere I need to go. And just to give a sense of the kind of equipment that I have, these are the housings that are all broken apart as they're ready to be cleaned and assembled. I'm currently working on a multi-year project entitled Space to Sea, a photographic journey into Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, just 25 nautical miles off the coast of Boston. It's part of a Hollings Ocean Awareness Award to showcase the surprising diversity of marine life off our coast. To accomplish these images, as part of my process, I'm working with students to modify and prototype wireless camera systems that enhance image making. We're bringing students into the field to experience the local marine wildlife. Our process is to conduct plankton tows, bring the living samples back to the lab to be photographed under a microscope. And we're inspired by the work of scientists at MIT Sea Grant 
where we're experimenting with a variety of photomicroscopy image making techniques. This, this image was created adding a drop of milk on the slide and just filming the dynamic flow visualization created by this Cleon or Petropod. There are other cool animals that are all alien like uh, on a plankton that are living in the ocean. This uh, is a larval crab. And if you look closely, you can see its compound eyes that are blue. Soon this creature will drop to the seafloor bottom, sea bottom and become a tiny full formed crab. As a wildlife photographer, I apply my image making skills to the micro scale. This composition of three serratium is currently on exhibit at the MIT Koch Public Galleries. And once the university's back open, I encourage all of you to join and visit. On this one magical day, working with a team of scientists, naturalists, and boat captains, I slipped into the water with a wetsuit, snorkel, 360 multi-camera system, looking to film what we thought was a basking shark moving on the surface. To my surprise, instead of encountering a basking shark, it was an enormous 3,000 pound great white shark, later identified as large march. I did the only thing I know how to do, which is keep the camera stable and captured 17 glorious seconds of footage from tip to tail that can be viewed in an immersive virtual reality experience. Photography really has the power to change our understanding of the world around us. And it is my lifelong goal to use the artistry of underwater photography to transform public perception that sparks our imagination, inspires conservation and builds a local stewardship about the extraordinary underwater wildlife and to connect residents in New England with the local marine wildlife just off our shores. Thanks. Thank you so much, Keith. All right, I think what I'd love to do now is bring Keith and Felice back on the screen, both of them together. Uh, and I see some questions are starting to come in on the Q&A, but I'll just start things off uh, to note that, so we've seen a huge, even in what, 10 minutes, a huge diversity of subjects, of equipment, of ideas, environments. Uh, and so we could talk for hours and hours about the specifics of each of those things. But in thinking about it as a collection of science photographs, all these things have things in common. They're good science photographs. So in your mind, as a photographer, what makes for a good or great science photo? Gulp. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I like to start with the easy ones. Well, yeah. looking at Keith's work, there's your answer. I mean, it's just, a, you know, you want, to, you want to look. I think that's the first thing. What do you think, Keith? Absolutely. I think the power of observation is so critical. I mean, I think so often people think you just go into the field, you just take a picture and you just find these moments. But really, it's a matter for me of watching and learning, observing. And after watching it for a while, you begin to be able to at least predict moments in the wildlife and the things that are happening. And so I think that I agree with you 100 percent, Lisa, that observation is probably the most important and pre-visualizing what you want to make for an image. And, and yet at the same time, leave open the surprises. Yeah. You know, that picture that I made in eternity ago of ferrofluid, when I put those magnets under the glucky material, I had no idea that I was going to find those shapes happening. I had some idea, but, and don't you find that, you know, you can kind of get lost in the process, that once you start seeing things that you didn't imagine, you kind of stay with it and maybe even get better pictures as you go along. Do you think? Absolutely. I think, you know, there's so much of the world where you're, you know, you're trying on something and then your eye gets open to another way of doing something and you uh, follow into to capturing those images or, you know, I think in part, that's even why collaboration is so wonderful. You learn something a little bit new and then you try and experiment. And while, so often for me, I have a mental map of what I want to photograph. I mean, so often that isn't what I see. It's the other things that happen and sort of being ready for those right. opportune moments of life just sort of shifting for those that are prepared for that is really where life gets very exciting for me. Well, you see it in your photographs. Oh, you're, you're, you do. You're, you're passionate about it and we feel it because it's so remarkable the way you do that. So your, your work... The, the main difference among a gazillion other things is that I am in control of my images. I, you know, basic, basically I work in a studio where I control the lighting and whatever else I can in fact control. You are 
certainly in control technically up to a point, but you never know what's going to happen at the last minute. You have to figure, you have to be prepared as your equipment appears as if you're quite prepared. Yeah. There is a question from somebody, what, what kind of a, a camera do you use for undergra uh, undergraduate? That's funny. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm dealing with undergraduates right now. Yeah. What, what camera are you using? Um, I use a Canon 5D Mark IV, um, but as I like to say, um, and I use a CNC underwater housing and dual YS250 strobes. But what I like to tell people is, is that it's not the camera that makes the photograph. Mm. It's the photograph itself. And I think when you look at Felisa's, and certainly I feel for myself, that uh, a lot of it is about making an image. And there's always a fancier camera. There's always more lights. There's always more equipment. And it always just adds complication. And I think that so much of image making is learning how to actually create the very thing you want to yeah. be creating. And um, I can't stress this enough. I, I spend a lot of time even just waiting on repetition of animals doing the same behavior, because if I see it once, I try and capture that again. And I'm sure in the studio, you start to see things and then tweak it just a little bit here and there. Yeah. And um, life is full of that uh, constant adjusting and, and uh, nuance, which is what makes photography so fun. So fun. I'm glad you used yeah. that word. It's fun. It should yeah. be. Fun. Yeah. Now in this process though, you're making some editorial decisions, right? You're deciding something, I'm going to photograph this and I'm not going to photograph that. How do you make that decision? Uh, that's called, I'm stressed always on that because sometimes in life there are these moments where everything is happening at once and how do you focus or how do you even know where to stand? Um, and at some point, experience gives you how to position yourself where you're more likely to see success than less. Um, but um, so much of it is a, a matter of sort of focusing on once I commit to something, I focus on that and try my best to, to work that problem through visually. And uh, I tend to, you could see in my images that I shoot up to in sequence that um, it's about like really moving and positioning and making something better. Sometimes you get it just on the first glance like that frigate bird, but I waited for that shot and was prepared for it. But in other instances, if it's stationary, sometimes I'm tinkering with lights, I'm trying to move myself, I'm maintaining stability. And so there's a lot of work to make the image just the way I sort of, I, I see it at that moment. I, and I wonder, Felice, if that's your same process too. It's a little different because uh, I sort of, I have an assignment to mm depict a particular phenomenon mm. and in a way it's it's giving me a parameter to work within which i i enjoy that otherwise you could go crazy you know yeah. Yeah. and the thing and the thing about and the same thing with you but i uh, i understand the science of what i'm photo I'm photographing i have a science background so not as deep as the scientist know understands but at the very least i can have what i what i do is i have a conversation going with the researcher and try to understand the 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 real bring it down to the essence of what it is that you're trying to say mm. and so i'm limited in that it's it's not about making it pretty i think science is already beautiful it's just revealing the beauty that's already there. But for me, it, 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 it's, more, I, there's, it's str more stringent in a way. Yeah, it's just a beautiful way of describing it. I and mean, I think it's really a visual language of removing the essence to just get at the core of how you want someone's eye to move, to understand the very things you want to convey uh, photographically or visually. It's very powerful. Yeah, right. There's a question uh, in the in the Q and A about modification of photographs after you've got that shot. What do you do to then present it? And this gets into the scientific integrity that you were talking about. But this, you have this these raw images, and you know, at National Geographic is gonna, is she's saying the editor says we don't want things that are stitched together. We want minor adjustments only. How do you tell a clear story and preserve the integrity of the raw image? I mean, I think that's the art of photography is is using the right equipment to get the right job and to get the right photo. And uh, so all of my photos that you have seen have not been altered in really any way other than just some minor levels and stuff like that. Um, I don't crop in. The lens is the choice of what I'm using uh, and my ability to interact with the animals to get there. And um, editors and when you're looking to sort of document something, you have to be true to what your image is. 
um, if you're in a fine art gallery or it's abstraction and you're not uh, documenting, you know, you feel free to, to manipulate and do as you wish, but you certainly have to acknowledge that. Um, the, the key part is, again, it, it comes with practice and experience doing that. And one of the things that digital gives you that's so wonderful is that as you learn, if you see you keep cropping in, then you need a different lens or you need to get closer to your subject. If you see that the colors are always blown out, then you need to adjust your lighting so you can learn on the fly for what you tend to like as an artist, as a photographer, to make those adjustments uh, and help yourself uh, in the future so that you're improving over time. Yeah, and, and you know, this, this, I have a whole chapter on image manipulation. I, I, because I am documenting research, I am very, very limited to any sort of, of manipulation or enhancement. Um, there are guidelines that the journals suggest that you, you don't do. But when I do anything, like for example, when I deleted the Petri dish, I always say that I have done the, the following, whenever the, the, in the caption. I do not consider myself an artist. I would, never, I would never show that image without somewhere saying that this is what I've done. And so there are, there are rules in science. And the, the problem is if you really, really think about photography itself is a manipulation of reality. Yeah. You know, the camera that you use is gonna give a different picture than my camera. And so the, the essence of photography is you are manipulating what we're seeing. It, it's, a, it's an issue. It's an illusion. It's, I mean, it's clear. I mean, that's what makes photography so powerful is that you can create a point of view through an image in many ways. Um, you know, I can um, be close in a, in a reef scene, for instance, you could be close to fish and give an illusion that there are fish everywhere all around, but maybe it's just this one rock that has right. something. And right. so your point of view on what you're documenting or um, really has... Uh, tells helps to tell the story and you know for me that's that's the fun of it is, is the perception of what people see um oftentimes you know on the side of a road there's like a you know you'd see like a hawk or something and sometimes you take out a long lens and you photograph it and you think you're in the middle of nowhere but you're right in an urban city <laughs> you know it, it's really fun yeah um, i'm seeing a lot of questions about specific equipment and editing tools um so though that's something that people are interested in, but also I'm hearing what tips do you have for getting the most out of cameras on a phone? Uh, so for, for this everyday photography. Right. Um, the first thing is use it a lot. <laughs> and more important after you use it, edit. You have got to start looking at how you're making the pictures and in that process, you will get to be a better photographer. You'll see that you left, you, you see, the problem is for all of us is that we know what we want to look at. And we're assuming that the viewer outside of ourselves is going to see what we see. But when you have a, a, a tree branch growing out of somebody's head, the viewer is gonna see that even though you didn't see it when you took the picture. So. I, I think that, you know, there's not a whole lot you could do that I could do with my, what I call my real camera. But the beauty of the phone is that you, you could quickly make an image, which I, I could not, I couldn't have taken that, those pepper Im, that pepper image 20 seconds later because the picture was gone. Mm -hmm. So it is in fact the wonderful part about having a phone. But you, in the end, I, I really think you have got to start paying attention and looking at them and start deleting them. Because I can't, but you know, my, my colleague, not my colleagues, but my friends, they have so many images, they don't even know where to even look. And it's, you know, they're not learning anything. And I think that's the key to learn something. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would just add, I think, to think about intent of what what do you want to show with this image i think one mistake people do a lot is they just push the button constantly and are just shot 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 and then hope for one of them to be right but if you pause and look at which one you like and then begin to ask yourself what do i want to say with this picture what would be important to me you know what is the main focus 
What is around it? Do you want movement? Those are all elements that go through uh, my mind all the time in taking a picture. And so I would use it more as what story do you want to say? Shoot, le- shoot a lot, but not with intention to shoot. Not just boom, 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 but rather shoot lots of things in your daily life and ask yourself which ones you like and have fun with it. I think the most important thing of all I could recommend to everyone is um, there's nothing I like more than having an assignment and having to go do my photography. And um, that joy and love is, is what you should really um, focus on. What have you learned from a photo that you've taken where you've looked at this and said, oh, I know what I want to do next, or I, I know what I shouldn't have done, or what I, what I want to avoid? How do you There's use your own that, photographs as a learning tool? There's a lot that I shouldn't have done, believe yeah. me. <laughs> Which, in fact, is this is why looking at your pictures is a means of getting to be a better photographer. Absolutely. It's, it's, for me, it's mostly technical issues that I've screwed up on. Uh, yeah. And the fun thing is that you, as you make the mistakes, you get to be better. What, what else is new? It's like with everything in life, right? Yeah, I, I think that is, it couldn't be more correct. You have to look at what you take and really study what is working for you and what isn't. And the other thing that I, I think people discredit is I practice an awful lot. Um, I think I practice with the dexterity of my hand, my strength, my being able to hold things up. And if you want an easy analogy, I would think of it as a golfer. You know, I can putt. I'm not particularly good, but people still, Tiger Woods still putts all day long, every day practicing and stuff. And I think there is a muscle memory that happens on this. And I do do a lot of, I spend a lot of time um, staying, using the equipment frequently and being very comfortable with all of the interactions of it. Um, And I think that helps out a lot. Yeah. And you know, and you know, what's not going to work because you, because you've done it, you've made the mistake and that in a way I find that I'm, I'm a better photographer than I used to be. Yeah. I mean, when I don't feel that way, then I think I'm in, I better give up. But I know that I shouldn't do a particular thing because it's not going to work. So mm-hmm. I, in, a, in a way, I save time. Right. And that's the other thing is to not hold yourself to a standard, to allow images not yeah. to work and to recognize that, you know, a lot of times I've tried things, it doesn't work out. And hopefully it leads to something that does, but everything isn't in an instant of an answer. Um, there are many problems that take time to work through or years of life to be able to build towards those achievements. It's not just uh, an immediate one day gratification, um, but rather a life of, of working on it. My goodness, this sounds a lot like the, the process of doing science. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, we have a, a question along those lines uh, from the, the Q&A here, uh, saying in the field of bio arts, the cross-disciplinary interaction between artists and scientists seeks to redefine the questions or perspectives being asked in research. Um, So we'd love to hear what you think about that approach as opposed to the role of the the artist or the photographer as a scientific documentarian. Uh, Forgive me, I'm not quite sure. Um, The dialogue between yourself as a science photographer and um, research in this process of photography um, redefining this questions being asked in the research oh. that you're not just observing the science from the outside. Your process is a part of. Well, again, um, Carolyn, I hope I paraphrase that acceptably. So the, I, I'm not, I'm not the artist, so I might be the wrong person to ask this of because ultimately for me, it is the science that I want you to look at. I don't want you, you can, if you want, think that these, these are artful, but uh, I don't want, I, I do have colleagues and friends who are artists who are, use science as a means of, of depicting, you know, their, their art. This is, this is wonderful. And I gather there are, there's a real symbi- symbiosis that can go on between the artist and the scientist. But that's not me, and so you'll forgive me, but I, I can't really make get you a good answer. Maybe you could talk about that, Keith. Yeah, I can a little bit, but I, I think that that's such a wonderful point that 
you know, as a perspective from a photographer, yours is from the science point of view, yeah. even though it translates into oftentimes art. And I think people yeah. confuse it. You have an intention with your photographs. Yes, thank you. Yes. And that intention is how you are communicating and visualizing it. And that's very, it's wonderful. Um, but it's in, different from the artist. That's who right. Is inspired by the, uh, the science. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it shows in what the process is and what, how people work, um, which is very important from what, what vantage point you're coming from for making your own work on. Yeah, thank you. And in, in my instance, I often, uh, you know, I'm collaborating with scientists and I feel very fortunate that I'm with people who, uh, you know, help to tell me or show me what is important or what is currently happening there. And so we're collaborating a lot to be able to try and show these things. Often they're, they're hard concepts to sort of um, find, but the, um, the partnership I find a very stimulating role in mm -hmm. terms of trying to communicate these issues, trying to support work that they're doing, trying to reach a public. Um, and so I, in, in some instances, I try to transcend a few different roles in the images, sometimes really documenting something. This is, this is what's really happening. Others trying to inspire people and letting the story of science come through on that. Um, and so, and sometimes it's several images to sort of convey those, those multiple points um, through. Um, but I feel fortunate that um, helping me you know, if you look at a rock and someone points out to you why that rock is of significance and then you photograph it in a way that's interesting, yeah. all of a sudden the story behind that rock becomes much more meaningful than at first glance looking at it. And sometimes we get confused with what is a very powerful image with what is a very powerful image that tells the story we want to communicate. And they could be the same, they could be different and lots of variations in between. Um, but I enjoy that that part of my process. I, th I think one of the reasons why uh, I started at MIT over 25 years ago, and it's, I can't believe it, but um, it took a while for the researchers to understand that I was not making my art, <laughs> that I was working for them, I was serving them. Yeah. And once they got it, then we flew. But uh, I, I am in the service of the research community. I think, uh, I think, you know, we don't have your collaborating scientists on the line, which perhaps was an oversight on our spot, yeah. but I imagine a lot of them would say, you know, this photograph that you took of my research, it helped me think about what I want to do next in this experiment or how I'm thinking about the science, how I'm communicating my science. So I think the photographs can also be a tool for shaping. Ab absolutely. Science. Thank you for saying that. And I'm told that is in fact the case, but it's not, but I'm also working uh, more so now on workshops on graphics because all scientists have to create figures for their journal submissions. And you, and it, it's a collaborative effort. We, come, we as a group, we come together virtually and you would be surprised by how thinking about what it is that they want to say in the figure is a clarification in their own mind about their science. Thinking about how to visually express it is a means of clarification, which is what Keith was saying as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, observation, again, it goes back to looking at how do you see things, how do you express things and visually communicating something. And I think one of the wonderful things about being at MIT is that the scientists are also engaging at the forefront of like trying and experimenting and pushing things. And so it allows both visual stimulation of how do we show this in a new and exciting way and how do we actually understand it. Um, and so I find that collaboration to be very, personally, we're very rewarding. Experience. Okay. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. So I'm gonna uh, pull one from the chat, which is do you ask your coworkers or and or friends for feedback on your photography or their perspective to see how you look at it and find and the message your audience gets from it. Talk about the feedback you get on your images. Well, I will tell you, uh, I, it's funny how you, you, maybe it's my genetic com composition, but uh, you, you remember the bad stuff. <laughs> I'll never forget, I gave a talk in Scotland. It was a big audience. And it was a, kind of the beginning of this area of my life. And somebody got up in the audience and said, you know, your, real, your pictures are really ugly. That was the word this person used. And so, 
you know, it threw me back a bit, um, but I remember that. <laughs> Whereas I don't remember what, see, I don't really believe what people say now. Everybody's going to say they're nice. I mean, what are they going to say? No, they're not nice. Don't you think, Keith? I couldn't agree more. I think <laughs> you need a close group of colleagues who can give honest and real feedback. Um, what I like to say is, uh, and I love my mom dearly, but if I asked her if she likes these pictures, I overwhelmingly get these are wonderful and I love them. But you need um, real feedback and comments. And I, I think one of the things is that in terms of teaching photography in, in art schools is, uh, is trying to get that kind of real feedback. So you learn how to present, you learn how to sort of articulate. And in some ways, you hope you get honest feedback that doesn't just say, I love it, but could you have focused a little more on this or should you have done this? And I think being hypercritical, at least of myself, I know I'm very hard on myself and with a few people who I really uh, trust who to give honest feedback for how to push me harder um, is, is what I'm looking for. And then, you know, sometimes when you get something right, um, you know, it just feels good, but uh, you need that, so you need real feedback. You, you went to photography school? I don't, I don't know that. I got, a, I got a MFA from Parsons, uh -huh. design and technology. And then now I teach photography both previously at Parsons and then now currently I teach photography at uh, SUNY, the Fashion Institute of Technology. Do you think, is this okay, Erica, to, for me to ask a question of Keith? I think so. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trained at all in photography and I'm, do you think you have to be trained in, in formal training? No, not at all. I think, um, I think the thing, um, I think what formal training does is help you think about some of the problems that maybe you didn't and maybe uh -huh. to learn along the way of, of, and to work through some problems, especially when you're very early in your career. Um, but I think that the many, some of the most famous photographers I know, at least amongst one of them, um, are not formally trained um, yeah. at all. But I think that learning, ha a lot of people have a natural eye, but then learning to sort of nurture that and express it is not always something that comes natural and easy to everyone. And I think school and or courses and workshops can help sort of begin to give you the vocabulary, begin to give you the things to look at that can be helpful instead of spending years of learning how to do something, maybe you can learn a little bit quicker. Um, but um, I think the most Im important thing is to understand at least yourself what you're really visually communicating and what you're really trying to communicate because luck while it happens only happens when you really are prepared I think. Yeah. Um, and so the key is to know how to make your picture so that if someone asked you to do it, you could really go out and do it, not just be like, Oh my God, how am I going to get this image? Yeah. And uh, even though that may be how you, you feel internally, <laughs> everyone doesn't need to know like my own stress of life kind of thing constantly. <laughs> yep. That is excellent insight. And so this of course is the kickoff for a whole program for people to go out and take images and um, see the world. So I think what I'd like to do is bring Brian back to talk a little bit about the logistics of what, what's going to happen on social media for the next two weeks as we, as we flood things. And then maybe we'll close out with one last question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lise, Keith, and Erica. That's great conversation. Um, so yeah, as Erica said, this is a kickoff to um, two weeks of imaging science, of encouraging you all to go out go out in your backyard, around your houses and apartments, and take some pictures and explore and discover um, through the lens of photography. Um, so to help you along the way, um, we have a couple of things um, set up for you. So the first is we have this hashtag, MITM Imaging Science. So if you follow that hashtag on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we're going to be posting tutorials on macro photography, astrophotography, basic camera settings, they, um, there are six tutorials there on a lot of the questions that um, we actually we haven't gotten a chance to answer. They're actually going to be answered in those videos. Whether you use a cell phone or DSLR or whatever camera you have, um, they're designed to, to be helpful to help you try new camera techniques that you may not have tried before. Um, we are also um, would love to see your images. So um, along with following that hashtag and seeing some of the resources that we post, um, please Take your own photos, tag them with that hashtag. And at the end of this program on June 20th, we're going to be featuring some of your um, uploaded photos as part of that closing webinar. Um, so with that, um, but I'm 
hand, going to hand it over to Erica to ask one more question of both of our panelists. All right. So my last question is we've got, we've got uh, several dozen people out there ready to take photos and I hope many more on social media who will watch the recording of this later. So what's your advice for them? What do you hope for them as they explore the world with their handheld cameras these next two weeks and beyond? Do it. <laughs> Don't think about it. Don't ask anybody, should I do it? Just go ahead and shoot. And if you, hopefully you will love it. If you don't, then don't do it. <laughs> really, it's, it's about life. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And find something that's accessible. Don't make a problem, a, a photographic problem harder. Don't, you know, we can't go anywhere right now. So photograph something that's right around you and make it really interesting. Um, and I, what I tell everyone is enjoy the process of photography. For me, it's a love. And I think you really got to find something that you like taking. I look forward to seeing these images. And uh, um, so I'm excited to see what you guys shoot. But really find something you like. I, I may, I'm going to add one more thing. <clears throat> think about, excuse me, <clears throat> think about how it looks to someone else. Mm. Think about how the viewer is going to see your picture because you, you know how to look at it and just consider, am I really showing a, the first time viewer what it is that I want them to see? Thank you so much. Uh, I wish we could keep talking, uh, but as you said, it's a beautiful day outside and there's a, there are a lot of things to discover. So thank you both so much for being thanks, a part Brian. of this. Oh, thank you. Our pleasure. And thanks, Brian, for putting it together. And everybody look for us on hashtag MITM uh, Imaging Science.